so we we talked about um, your favorite movies and stuff like that and so um, I wanted to read something and it it is about a conversation that C.S. Lewis and um, and Tolkien uh, J.R.R. Tolkien um, had um, they were professors together there, there was a group of guys who had similar interests and they were all professors and it was called the Inklings um, where they would just gather together and okay we're in Britain at a pub you know and talk about you know all these different things and philosophize and all this other stuff and so um, now I'm not sure what the original setting of this meeting was but it ended up being a walk late night I mean we're talking like three in the morning type stuff um, on September 19th 1931 this was a turning point in C.S. Lewis's life where he went from an atheist and at this point he was a theist saying okay there maybe is probably a God there but you know whatever I'm not sure about the whole Christian thing um, and, and, and then becoming a very strong uh, Christian who would defend the faith. Um, and so this meeting between, between C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, um, and uh, another guy named Dyson, um, and um, they, after dinner, the three men went for a walk beside the river and discussed the nature and purpose of myth. Lewis explained that he felt the power of myths, but that they were ultimately untrue. And just to understand myths, he, he loved reading things like of the Norse mythologies and, and other things. So, you know, we're talking about just grand stories and stuff like that. So, um, as he expressed the, it to Tolkien that myths were lies, even though lies breathe um, through, through silver. <laughs> and then no, Tolkien replied emphatically, they are not. Tolkien resumed, arguing that myths, far from being lies, were the best way of conveying truths which would otherwise be inexpressible. We have come from God, continued Tolkien, and invariably the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of true light, the eternal truth that is with God. Since we are made in the image of God, and since God is the creator, part of the imaginedness of God in us is the gift of creativity. The creation, or more correctly, the sub-creation of stories or myths is merely a reflection of the image of the Creator in us. As such, although myths may be misguided, they steer however shakedly towards the true harbor, whereas materialistic progress leads only to the abyss and to the power of evil. Going on to say, let me just sum up. Um, they were saying that there, there's something that's behind the myths that people made up that are like a shadow of what was the truth. And, and the conversation goes on to say that the story of Christ and his death and his resurrection was a myth. But it was the only true myth that actually happened. Now this made, now I know that's kind of cerebral and stuff like that, but, but basically saying is, you know, we catch things in stories that end up pointing, inadvertently sharing something that might be a God truth. Now it's not going to get people to God, but it might be by accident. And so uh, I, I thought about Paul in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, he's in Athens. And he is sharing with the, 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 the smart people of the town uh, who always philosophized and stuff, probably a lot like, like Tolkien and, and, and uh, uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, and as he's sharing the gospel, 
he quotes their poets. Now, if you probably found the quote and looked at it in context, you would say, oh, that's way off. You know, that's, you know, but he said, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Now, again, the context of what these Greek philosophers, poets, wrote probably had nothing to do with Christ, but Paul was taking a snippet of going, they stumbled into truth with this statement. And then he used that as a springboard to share the truth. So tonight, we're going to just talk about some stories. Stories that we watch year in and year out. Those Christmas movies. Now, I'll just let you know right now, watch the nativity, awesome stuff. There's so many great ones and all that. But I, I'm going to be going with the secular ones. And just to say that they didn't probably even mean this, but there's a truth in here that's being illustrated in this story. Now, I may be far-fetched in doing this, but, but, but here we go. First one, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Y'all like that one? Okay, anyway, I remember crying in a, in a, in a department store because that went, went off and it was like, oh, okay, anyway. Um, um, originally, it was a book uh, that... Uh, we call him Dr. Seuss, uh, Gensel's his last name, but, but in 1957, uh, he wrote that. And um, uh, the story behind it was there were just a lot of things going on, and he was, like many of some of the people in this, so disenchanted with the commercialization. Now, listen, this is in the 50s. Can you imagine if they saw what it is today, <laughs> the commercializations, and you got to have this and buy this and all. And, and so, you know, and he looked at himself. It was like the day after Christmas. He looked at himself in the mirror and he saw a Grinch-like person staring back at him. And then he went and started writing the story of the Grinch. Anyway, um, 1966, the movie came out after the book had been out for a while. Here's some actors that are in it. Okay, who, who was the main voice? Somebody. I know you know this. Boris Karloff. He played the Frankenstein monster. He also played in a lot of other things. And he has that, that voice that is, uh, you know, scary. The song, You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, was sung by, and it's not in the credits, but um, Thurl Ravencroft. Do you know who Thurl Ravencroft was? And what he's, he's known for a very famous voice. They're great. He was Tony the Tiger. So next time you watch The Grinch, you listen and say, yes, that's him. Now, a couple of things, because I, I, I thought June Foray was Cindy Lou Who. She was the voice behind Cindy Lou Who. What was great is finding out what else she's been in. She was on the Bull, Bullwinkle Show. She was the voice of Rocky the Squirrel. That's just neat. That's just neat to me. As well as, if you've watched Natasha Fatal, she was the voice behind that with the Russian accent and stuff like that. And the Bugs Bunny cartoons, um, she was Granny, as well as Witch Hazel. That's the one I was trying to get Hansel and Gretel and all that Hansel, you know, that, that one and stuff like that. So anyway, I just cut neat little things about the movie, stuff like that. But, but, you know, everyone, has everybody seen The Grinch? So I don't need to tell you the story and stuff like that. But, but here, here's the thing that, that, what was his problem? It was a problem of the heart. And that is our problem. And God's word 
says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now as you watch the myth of the Grinch just old Christmas and they showed the little thing going down as he's going down the hill trying to keep it and it just shows the heart change. I think that's a beautiful image of what Christ wants to do for us. Now, did Dr. Seuss think about that? Probably not. But I just think, you know, again, wow. What a thing to, as grandkids or whomever, you can bring on the conversation of a heart that was changed. It's a wonderful life. That was yours, right? It's a wonderful life. 1946, that movie came out. Um... Here's where you don't want to get any truths from, and that is the angelology. Um, you know, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wing. Okay, listen, listen. We do not become angels. We, angels are separate created beings, um, and, and, and actually right now we're a little under them, but we will be over them. The Bible says we will actually judge angels and, 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 and stuff. So, so I'm just saying, don't look to it to teach you about angels and, and stuff like that. And um, it's, again, you just got to look at it at the fun story that, that, that it is. Um, here's here's the, 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 the truth that it illustrates. This is what a life looks like that puts others first. Good old George Bailey. He had grand plans for himself. I mean, he was going to go to see the world and, and he was going to have a, a suitcase this big and uh, all these different things that we look at and then he was going to... Uh, all these things that he always... Now I'm going to send my brother to college. No, I'm going to keep the building alone, and I mean, just constantly. Now, he didn't have the best attitude about it, but, but again, Philippians 2 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should, not, should, should look only not to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. And then the next verse, this attitude that was in Christ should be in you. So, again, just an opportunity of thinking. And then there's Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. Rudolph is as old as me. Actually, he's a lot older. The movie is as old as me. He started in 1939. And, and you know what's so funny? Things and stories about these stories get told, and many times they're not true. I heard about the story of, you know, you know, just... It simply was Montgomery Ward Department Store had in the past given at Christmas time to children coloring books. But they had to buy the coloring books. And so they thought, hey, let's make a book, a story, a Christmas story. And they got this guy whose name um, um, was uh, Robert May. And he simply wrote the story that kind of more like a poem and then turned the poem into uh which actually turned it into a song and and then the song got sung and and uh um but 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 it started with just a simple let's get people into our store it was a marketing campaign what can we learn from rudolph we are uniquely created by god and sometimes a difference in one person as seen by another person 
There's something off. Psalm 139. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. In the New Testament, it says, We are God's workmanship in Ephesians chapter 2. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That God has made you and gifted you um, in, in talents as well as spiritual gifts and all of this because He's made you unique so that you can be used. First Corinthians says, Now the body is not made up of just one part, but many. Later on it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Let's bring that to Rudolph. They thought he was weird and, oh, get away, Shana. Oh, he's no use at all until it's a foggy night. But anyway, but here's the thing. We could hide our giftedness. We cannot develop the giftedness that God has given us. But God's word says we need to use our giftedness. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve, and on and on and on. God has made you with value. Sometimes it's hard to find, where does that fit? White Christmas, looking back there, that was your favorite, right? All right. And Holiday Inn. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about both. Um, Holiday Inn, the movie, uh, came out in 1942. Uh, White Christmas came out in 1954. Um, the song was written by Irving Berlin. Does anybody know what Irving Berlin's belief system was? He's Jewish. Singing about a white Christmas. Huh? In California. I, in California. Now, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. It is a sad song. I mean, it's very, you contemplate and all, and when, you, when, when I read a little bit more, you'll understand even more. Part of his biography and how much this played into the the tone of the song was in 1928. Again, this was um, the 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 song was first aired in 1941. But in 1928, um, his three-week-old son died on Christmas Day, and so on Christmas Day they didn't celebrate Christmas, but on Christmas Day. Every year after that, his wife and he would visit the graveside. So you can see why there might be a little bit of melancholy in the tone of the song. Um, he did. Um, he had a home in California, but he also had one in, in New York in the, the mountain area. And, and, uh, and, and so we think, most think that that's probably where it was written and some of the ideas uh, of, of what, what uh, he depicts in the song. Um, but uh, he wrote the song for a musical that would eventually become a movie, which is Holiday Inn. Um, and the song first aired in, in December 24th, 1941. That's an important date. It was aired in the the Kraft Music Hall radio show. And that is Kraft as in Kraft Macaroni and Cheese Kraft. So same people. Um, and it's sung by Bing Crosby or Bing Crosby. What happened a couple weeks before that? December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. What was the mood 
of Americans. And, and this, this um, uh, radio show was also aired with the military, to the military that were um, quite an impact as people were taken from their homes to go off to war. Um, um, the song was written what Ber Irving Berlin thought was tongue-in-cheek at first and he even there was a line in it that got taken out because of the mood of what was going on that talked about sitting at your swimming pool with a glass of lemonade you know in Palm Springs and, and stuff like that and dreaming about a white Christmas but but it became Vin Crosby said he used to go with the um, how, what's it called um, that go and, and entertain for the military the um, USO I was going OS or something, USO. <laughs> um, and he actually, he would sing, but he didn't want to sing. In fact, he was like, it's such a sad song. But the, the soldiers would demand it <laughs> because it, it would bring back, even though in a sad, I wish I was home type thought. So, um, so anyway, that, that's all about the song and stuff like that. But now let me tell the story. How, has everybody seen... Um, White Christmas. Not, and it's okay if you didn't and stuff like that, but it's, they're two entertainers, Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye, and um, that's their real names, but um, um, they were in war together. And during the war, they kind of did numbers and stuff like that because one was, was famous already, but there was some bombing and a wall came down and it was going to land on being Crosby. Instead, Danny Kay rushes and pushes him aside, yet injuring his arm. Here's something to think about when you watch it next time. Living under the law or living in grace? Living under the law, the rest of his Decisions in life, Bing Crosby, the character that he had, was Danny Kay manipulating him. For every time that he, okay, you know, I'd love to be a party show. Well, I'm a one-act show. And he says, yeah, I guess so. And he rubbed the arm that got injured in the wartime accident. And then, you know, when they saw the sisters and all, all, all that, you know, they were going to go. And it's like, oh, you know, every step of the way, it was guilt. It was, I owe him. I can never pay him back for all the things that, you know. And so it was the law is you owe me. You better or else. Meanwhile, there's living by grace. And the hotel was their former general who led them, who provided for them, who stuck up for them and eventually was, you know, transferred to another place. But, you know, they would end the song because we love him, we love him. Anyway, so, um, you know, all that was going on, they acted in grace towards him. When they saw that he was in need, he didn't ask for help or anything, but they said, let's pour our resources, our talents, our everything because of what this guy was for us. And, and so living by grace is not, oh, I owe God and I better or else. It's, oh, God, you've done so much for me. How could I not live in that grace and acting in grace towards others? Romans 7, 6 says this, but, by, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. Christmas Carol. Written in, in 18, I was going to say 19, 1843, December 19th, the book was released. Um, and all that. Now, it was a, an immediate hit. It, it helped Charles Dickens and, 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 and who wrote a lot of other things. But let me, just, let me just tell you how many movie, TV, 
adaptations. I'm just going to read the year of the movies are TV adaptations. First one, 1935, 1938, 1951, 1962, 1970, 1977, 1979, 1983, 1984, 1985, 1988, 1992, 1994, 1998, 1999, 2001, 2004, 2009, 2011, 2011. That's a lot of remakes, twist of the story. Now you have Mickey Mouse in there. You have the Muppets, which is one of my favorite ones that they've done. You have the Flintstones. You have the Jetsons. Um, you've got um, Doctor Who. You've got the Smurfs. You've got Mr. Magoo. I mean, you've got all sorts of different versions. Pick your favorite um, and stuff like that. Now, this to me illustrates the miserable life of living for self. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 7 and 8. Tell me if this does not describe the character of Scrooge. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless a miserable business. Bah humbug. I would go back to the Grinch point. A change of heart is what he needed. The Santa Claus. Tim Allen, 1994. Um, Scott Calvin was his name, initials SC, um, ends up inadvertently killing Santa by distracting him as he's on the roof and he slips and falls. And then he disappears and nothing but the suit is left. He puts the suit on and by putting the suit on, there was this clause that was in this little business card says put the suit on, but on it in very, very, very small print was you take, you put the suit on, you become the big guy. Now, I like the movie because it's just, you know, the magical wonder, you know, it's whatever. It's just, it's a fun movie. Um, but it illustrates a transformed life where he's a recent divorcee, he's angry, he's selfish, he's in a toy company that wants to put more tanks in kids, you know, I mean, he's a ruthless business guy, he's all this. <laughs> But after the suit comes on in that coming year, things change. Now, physical changes, and that's funny. You know, suddenly he's growing a white beard, and, you know, and he's gaining weight, but yet he's still healthy, and you know, all this other stuff. You know, it's, it's funny and stuff like that, but there's changes that happen where he's, like, suddenly going, wait, we don't, we don't need to push a tank for a toy for a car. You know, and it showed a picture of Santa, you know, driving in a, you know, a Panzer, you know. And it's just like, yeah, and he just... The, the inside, inside started changing as well as the outside. Where at the end of the movie, you know, oh, he still has his flaws and stuff, but, but he's different. Now, here's the thing. We are to be clothed with Christ. We who have received Christ, we are to be conformed to his image. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have gone. The new has come. Uh, Romans 12, 1 says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's just a good visual illustration 
of a life being changed. Now, listen, we don't put on a red suit, but we are to clothe ourselves with Christ. Last one. But you didn't do mine. I'm sorry, I had a list thing. A Charlie Brown Christmas. December 9th, 1965 was when it first aired on TV. Some things about it that um, the producers, well, there was, a, there was a time limit, so things got pushed through that they probably wouldn't have let through. Um, the selection of having jazz music for a children's thing, you know, that's, that's crazy. That's not going to work. Oh, man, you still hear that on the radio now. You know, they're playing Linus and Lucy or Christmas time and, and just uh, beautiful and all that. Also, the big words where I think Pig Pig walks in and, and Linus starts going off about the dirt. and might, might be something. And Sharon, I'm look, keep looking at you because you directed this twice um, and you probably know all the words. But, you know, this is probably some, could be some dirt from Mesopotamia that was under during the time of, you know, it just goes off in all these huge words and stuff like that. And again, that's something the producers were going. But it, it actually was one of the first animated um, Christmas shows. The year after was The Grinch. The year after that was, you know, some of these other ones where, where um, you know. But, but here's, here's the great thing about a Charlie Brown Christmas. It, it illustrates the commercial is bad and all, the commercialism and all that and stuff. And, and you just see. Um, one thing I have a problem watching any of the penis things that when I was a child I didn't notice. These kids were mean to each other. They were just downright mean to Charlie Brown. It just was not a nice thing. Um, anyway, but to me, some of these other ones, like I was saying, you know, inadvertently, they might have illustrated a biblical truth. But Charlie Brown kind of ends with this. Can anyone tell me what Christmas is all about? This is another thing the um, producers were like going, ooh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and Linus gets on the stage. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were so sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Yeah, it's a little late. The, the tree dies and comes back, and they love it. And I uh, take all the stuff off Snoopy's. You know, but anyway, uh, let's pray. Jesus, uh, just thank you. It's a fun time of the year, and there's fun movies we watch and all. But but God help us. Help us to always have an eye um, uh, to see where, even inadvertently, it can point to the messages in your word. But God give us wisdom to know, hey, that's not a movie I should watch and all that. But, but, but God, uh, um, in, in this time, in these classics uh, of movies that are watched year in and year out, and, and there's so many others that we could dig into, but, but God, just um, help us to be able to communicate your truth. Pointing to you, Jesus. I pray in your name.
Amen.